So if I'm craving something and I don't have a banana in front of me, oh, well, I'm craving it, but the banana is not there and I focus on it all the time. You know as well as I do, if I or you or anyone have these cravings for food, that's on our mind. Yes. That, that is on our mind. We're already digesting it already. We're pulling stuff up. There's a change in our body. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, that's tons of experience where they, the saliva comes, you know, just when the dogs hear the bell or whatever it is, right? Yeah, where, just like that. where the body actually responds chemically to the thought. So mm -hmm. that makes, that makes, I never connected that dot before. <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> Hello and welcome to our class today. We're going to be talking about emotional weight and cravings. Um, that will include mind-body and how that affects our weight and our cravings. So Ron, can you tell us a little bit about um, this topic? I mean, this is a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. Um, no pun intended, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and so it is, it is, and, and I, I've been involved in this for years. I have a lot of family members that have had problems with this and clients, a lot of clients who have, have desired to get down to a certain weight or, or at least not overeat. And, uh, but you know, this applies in this emotional weight loss to all people. A lot of people eat out of craving and they don't have a real reason other than they're just, they're bored or they're desperate or something else. And, and yes, uh, weight and emotions go together. So uh, an emotional weight loss, uh, mind-body dictionary class, right? Awesome. Okay. So um, Denise, you've had some of this. And so just to, so people know how much we're involved in this, um, you sometimes have craved over the years different things, right? Mm -hmm. Name some of the things you've craved. Um, well, one that I grew up with and that carried over into my adult life quite a bit was ice cream. Mm -hmm. So that was one that would get me in. And, and uh, normally my coping mechanism was to just not have it in the house. So if I did want it, I had to be really, really desperate because I have to, you know, be motivated enough to figure out what to do with the kids, get in the car, go to the store, come back <laughs> because I wouldn't buy it on. I had just had a promise. I wouldn't buy it. Right. Um, but if it was in the house, I need it. Um, and so that one was one every now and then chips would come in, um, chocolate for sure. Yeah. Those were some of the top ones, I think. Yeah. And I had a milkshake, uh, addiction and an ice cream addiction. And uh, uh, for a while there, I, I went through the donut apple fritters addiction, uh, the sticker bars, the, let's see, I had the, um, Dr. Pepper. I did that one for a while. Peanut butter, of course. I did the peanut. Did you ever do the peanut butter one? Yes. Just, yeah. it, every day, you just had to have that peanut butter sandwich. And yeah. crazy, you know, when yeah. I went through. And, and peanut butter, to me, is very addictive. Uh, I, I have a sister that has the almonds addiction. And oh. uh, not talking almond joys, just simply nuts. And, of course, there's the chocolate one. I have a sister, that, another one, chocolates. Uh, and a lot of funny stories about that about how she would go sneaking into the, the boxes the parents were going to give to someone at, of chocolates at Christmas time, you know, open it up and take a chocolate <laughs> and put it down as if, so no one would know. And so the person who got the gift had less chocolates because my <laughs> sister had ate them. And so she definitely was a chocoholic and an ice, and she was into ice cream. And as you mentioned, your, you know, your father, but, um, so those are, you know, I just mentioned about cravings, but what about, there's also the people that, um, that, you know, they gain weight with hardly eating anything. They just go into a room, they smell the chocolate and they gain weight. And that's really frustrating for them, right? They, yeah. it's, it's really difficult. So is that a thing, Ron, to smell something and gain weight? Uh, the, well, actually, we, we don't realize it, but the body is an amazing thing, right? When we drink water, it breaks the water down and it, into its parts, hydrogen and oxygen. And then, but what you urinate 
is not exactly what you drink, of course. There's other particulates, but the body reforms that hot water. It isn't what you drink and it goes straight through. It absorbed into the system, it uses it the parts, hydrogen and oxygen is used by the mitochondria of the cell and things like that. It's reformed the same with the food or food is absorbed and, and reformed. So, and we also have some other things going on. We have friendly flora that uses a lot of the, that. And so when there is a bowel movement and you have fecal matter, um, you know, you say that food equals what I know because it's all massaged, different stuff comes out with the friendly flora. The volume in doesn't have to equal the volume out. It actually could change. Um, uh, I know that sounds like a strange concept, but it even happens at the lymph nodes. Not a volume into the lymph node is not the same that comes out of the lymph node, each and every lymph node. So there's biochemistry going on. So it's very possible that you could smell something and then you take the biochemistry that's already in your body and modify it based upon the smell. Um, it even, I didn't know I was gonna get into this, but just for a moment, um, they, they've done studies with athletes over the years, especially in uh, Eastern Europe, where they would spend half of their time in uh, the actual exercise, like basketball, skiing, whatever, and they spend exactly the same amount of time in meditation because they mm -hmm. found out if they were thinking about it, concentrating, focusing on it, it fired up brain cells that would fire up as if they were in the exercise activity. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies where if someone thinks about eating a piece of candy, it will fire up some of the same cells as if you actually ate the candy. And then the body will take some of those, some of those nutrients inside your body. It'll pull it up. And yeah, I know, I saw that face of yours. You went, oh, no. oh hey, know. what's going on there? Well, I've heard the story, you know, I've heard of that study with the athletes, you know, and how they can meditate on it. And it actually improves their game quite a bit. It's significant. A lot, a yeah. lot. I did it with ping pong I'm with my son. I did it with my son. I said, okay, let's go play real ping pong. And let's go to play the video game and then think about it. And then let's come back, do a little meditation and then let's play ping pong in reality. And he improved his game, yeah. he improved his game really quick. I added a little video game to it because I really wanted him to get the visual, but it works with food. It works with diet, nutrition. So if I'm craving something and I don't have a banana in front of me, oh, well, I'm craving it, but the banana is not there and I focus on it all the time. You know as well as I do, if I or you or anyone have these cravings for food, that's on our mind. Yes. That, that is on our mind. We're already digesting it already. We're pulling stuff up. There's a change in our body. Yeah, well, and that's, I mean, that's tons of experience where they, the saliva comes, you know, just when the dogs hear the bell or whatever it is, right? Yeah, where, just like that. Where the body actually responds chemically to the thought. So mm -hmm. that makes, that makes, I never connected that dot before. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> I mean, it's great. I get it. But it's also like, oh, shoot. Well, it, the sense. negative part is if people are controlled by their, by their non-self mind, by their mm -hmm. ego mind, then uh, yeah, it's going to be a problem. And, um, but if they're, but if they're working with their true self, yeah. their real self, they, that means they can use their thought patterns. They can use their thinking patterns as a way to actually modify it. They can catch themselves in that those thoughts that are, are negative. But to me, they're negative because I'm not, I'm putting somebody else as my God or something like an ice cream or a chocolate. That becomes more important. Yeah. In fact, I even used the other day with someone I, I'm using, uh, I've used over the years on and off. There's the coping self. The coping self is, oh, I've got to have that chocolate. I've got to have the chocolate. Or, oh, Man, if I have it, I'm guilty. I shouldn't do it. I promised I wouldn't eat it. And so that coper inside has all these parts to it. The, the emotional part, the craving part, the, 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 uh, the uh, thinking part that is not our real self. Our real self, well, it's just chocolate. Yeah, it's enjoyable. I can have peace and enjoy it. And it's fine. It doesn't bother me. And, and, and I can eat some, I can have a little ice cream. It's not going to be a big deal. I don't get overwhelmed and go, oh, secretly go, blah, 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 right? 
or yeah. video game. Okay, no one sees me play a video game, so that's it's not going to be a problem. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we have the co we have the coper, and we have the the true or the real self. So this is really important because I, I know parts of what I'm saying they're still proving in in uh, psychoimmunology and the connection between the brain, the body, and the heart, and that's still going. It's an ongoing science about how the, what we think has power over our body and what our, uh, the, what's happening to our body has power over our mind. Um, I mean, I have a whole bunch of stuff on that with amputees and their hands and phantom pain. It's really cool. Yeah. It's awesome, awesome stuff. But anyway, I want to bring in here on, on the coping. So here a person is, they want that chocolate. And they, and they have studies about this where they, they crave the chocolate but they put in guilt. So they, I can, I can do this little object. So here I have the craving of the chocolate, but I tap, I top it off with a little guilt. <clears throat> now, the nice people, cherry. That's a nice, yeah, cherry. nice little cherry, I'm guilt, yellow I'm guilt, cherry. I'm guilted. Right. <laughs> and <clears throat> now the people that have the guilt here and they go through a weight loss program and they do everything they can, but they have it this craving topped off with guilt, as opposed to another person who has the craving and they have something else, I don't know. They, they have the fun on top of that. Hey, this is fun. I get to go through this program. I'm gonna learn a lot, da, 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 da. And they, let's say the craving's exactly the same. This one's having fun and this one's having guilt. Uh, who has the success? The fun guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And that's logical to us. Now, the, the research was about the guilt, that the guilt was not, that had more difference than the program you used. Really? Yeah, you could use almost any program. If you had the guilt, it wasn't very successful. And everybody's go, okay, I've got to buy all this special food. Well, that's more of a key than the special food because some companies out there, it's crap in their food. They don't tell you that. Yeah. It's chemicals and it's really hard on the liver. So, you know, six months to two years, you're going to have to have it all again. And, and it's more difficult the next time. Yeah. You deal with what's happening here. You deal with the mind and the body and the heart connection, those feelings and thoughts. You change that. You change your life. And that's, that's so simple. Um, you know, the irony of it, Ron, uh, that I, I run into a lot is so often we run circles around the issue, you know, so if the issue is the guilt, you know, okay, this program, that program, this food, that food, you know, and, and just, and this, whatever it is, but because the guilt, ooh, that's, that's kind of a dirty word. <laughs> you just said a, a guilt's a dirty word. <laughs> yeah, five, now how many letters? I don't know, five or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you have to spell it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, no one wants to feel guilt, and uh, well, unless they're strange. Um, but it could be sadness, it could be fear, it could be anger, it could be, you know, it's, it's not necessarily guilt is the problem, it's that I'm holding on to it and it make it special. Yeah. I make it important. When I say special, it becomes important. And why? Because I'm avoiding it, but yet I'm harboring it. Avoiding wow. and our harboring. We hope you enjoyed that preview into our losing emotional weight class. If you would like to continue on and see parts two through seven, go ahead and click on the link in the description below to access the full course. We hope to see you there.